All right, welcome. So, um, can we start by just doing a show of hands? So, how many in here? Well, wait. <laughs> how many in here have mobile apps published in an app store? That's a lot of you. Okay, now think about one of those apps, and then think about how often do you publish updates for the app? Okay, is it once, twice per year? Is it you know four times per year? A couple of people there. Is it monthly? Yeah. Two times per month. Nice. Every week. <laughs> Multiple times per week? Every day? <laughs> what about multiple times per day? You're laughing, right? That's, that's crazy. That's crazy talk, right? Or is it? Maybe not. So with this talk, I hope to maybe point you in the direction that the times they are changing. That um, maybe there are some things that are no longer true. Uh, and some new things that are true that will enable you to do a weekly or even daily uh, updates to your apps in your app stores. So to do that, I'm going to use a, a sample. So I'm also going to start with, uh, with a sample. I'll just show you what the app is, and then I'll jump back into some slides, and we'll end up with a demo. Okay, so the sample, you may already know it. It was published at Build uh, last year. It's called My Driving, and it's a mobile app built with Xamarin, uh, targeting iOS, Android, and Windows. Um, and it's an IoT app in the sense that uh, the app is intended to track your driving habits. So what you do is you buy this uh, OBD device, which is an onboard device that you can plug into your car, and that will get telemetry from your car and tell you how fast you're going, how much gas you're using, uh, your engine load, and then it transmits that uh, via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to your mobile device. And then the mobile device combines that with your GPS location and then sets that up to the Azure IoT hub. And then there's a bunch of interesting Azure things I'm not going to talk about, uh, applying machine learning and essentially giving your rating about your driving and comparing you to other drivers. So I'll just focus on, on the mobile app. The, the whole thing is open source. You can actually go to Microsoft's GitHub page and, and find this app. So all the samples I'm showing today, you can, you can find there. All right, so let me just show you what the app looks like. So I have my, oops, I have my device here. Uh, so I'm just mirroring this device. So we'll launch it here. And uh, the first thing it does is that you can authenticate with Facebook or Twitter or Microsoft. I'm just going to do a demo version, so I'm going to skip this off. And this is set up with some mock data. And now you see a map, and you can see we're, uh, we're somewhere here in, uh, in Singapore. And um, now imagine that I'm in my car, and I have this device plugged in. Then I can hit this red uh, record button. And now the device is going to search for this IoT device. Uh, and it's actually not going to find one, right, because I'm not actually in my car right now. But there's this simulator thing I can tap, so that now it's simulating data being transmitted from this IoT device. So now pretend I'm driving my car around Singapore uh, for some time, and when I'm done, I'm going to hit end. I'm just going to name this drive and around, and hit OK. And then you get a small summary of this uh, drive. So I was driving for 10 seconds, didn't really go anywhere, apparently. But it was a simulation, so that's OK. So that's one thing. Then it will record past trips. Now, this is just mock data. So uh, here's some sample data, which is James Montemagno, you probably know, driving around Seattle. So in this screen, uh, you can see one of his drives. And you can use this slider in the bottom to uh, look at any given time in this route. How long has he driven? What's his speed, and so on. So he's driving around Seattle, and then you can hit this endpoint to go there. And then finally, you can get your score. So now I'm apparently I'm Scott Guthrie uh, rather than James. Which that's pretty good. I mean, I like James, but 
maybe Scott is, is an even better. <laughs> um, anyway, so he's got his score here, 98%, amazing driver. And then you can go to settings and you can change away from this weird Imperial uh, to the metric system, which I definitely prefer. And that's basically the app. So now you know what it is. And now I'm going to uh, just do something because now I became a manager. So I don't actually program very much anymore. <coughs> but now I can do it. Now I'm kind of away from my day job. So I'll just do a small thing here. And bear with me just for a second. So what I want to do is uh, just change. Actually, let me move this. You can see this blue bar here at the top. I'm going to change that to be black instead. I guess that's my programming skills <laughs> these days. And then I think I just want to bump the build version. All right, so I'm pretty happy with this change. So I'm going to just uh, review this. Yeah, it looks good. I'm going to commit that to my source. Uh, black tint. I'm going to push that to my Git repo. <coughs> awesome. That was my programming for today. <laughs> now uh, let's jump back into the presentation. So I'm going to use, I'm going to get back to the sample throughout the presentation. So My main objective with this talk is to have you guys release your apps more often, in case you didn't guess from my um, intro. So if you are one of the people raising your hands on the yearly cycle, I want to get you guys to quarterly. If you're on a quarterly, to monthly. If you're on monthly, to bi-weekly, or even weekly, or even multiple times per week. Okay, That's why I want to try to convince you to think about doing. So why? Why would you want to do that? Why do you want to increase your release frequency? Well, as you do this, you're getting closer and closer towards a continuous model where, in theory, every change you make to your app goes all the way out to your users. Right? Maybe you've seen uh, people in the web space doing this. Like Every pull request is actually deployed to production once it's merged. Why are we not doing it with mobile? Well, if you do it, uh, you get some benefits. One is a redu reduced lead time, and the lead time is the time from someone gets an idea until that idea is actually in the hands of the users. Now, obviously, if you're releasing all the time, uh, the lead time is much, much shorter rather than if you're batching up a bunch of changes together and then shipping all of those in one big chunk six months later, right? So that means the customers are getting value faster. Okay? And not only that, you're also getting something. Because if you have an idea for a feature, you implement it, and you get it out there, well, then you have the opportunity to get feedback about that feature, to learn from your users if they're happy about it or you want to make changes. But if you develop the feature, like the first month of the year, and you only ship it the 12th month of the year, well, then you're actually waiting a full year until learning about that change you made, whether it was a good change or not. So you can learn a lot faster from your customers. Also, the release process itself, the, the process of getting the app onto the store, because you're doing it all the time, you tend to tweak it, and it becomes much, much more reliable and efficient to do. So for instance, if you're releasing once per year, maybe it's OK to have just one person on the team that's the guy that actually knows how to do that, because you just do it once per year. But if you're doing it every day or every week, that's not going to fly, because that person's going to be on vacation at some point, right? So you tend to kind of need to write that down and, and formalize it a bit and share it and make it efficient. And then you're going to get uh, basically higher quality. And the reason for that is if you're making a very small change, you have an, a good code base, and you're making a very small change to it, um, well, that's a lot easier to reason about than having added you know, 10 features and having to retest the entire application. So that's good. Um, and if you think about it, the difference between a yearly cadence and a weekly cadence is 50x. So 50x opportunities for learning faster than your competitors who may be on a, week, uh, on a yearly cadence. That's massive. It's, it's really big. 
But I mean, you guys were laughing in the beginning when I was asking if anyone's releasing every day or every week. So you might ask, is anyone actually doing this? And so I looked up, what are some of the be world's best engineering teams doing? Some of the world's best apps. So if you take, I mean, this is just my opinion, some, some very good apps. Certainly they have, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of users having quite high ratings. Um, now, how often do they release? How often is there an update to Google Maps or Facebook? Well, it turns out that these teams actually are doing this. They're pushing out every single week or every other week uh, a new update. So it can be done. Now, obviously, we can't all be you know, Google or LinkedIn, um, but I hope to convince you in this talk that maybe you don't have to be Google or LinkedIn to start beginning to do these things. All right, so I guess by now what I've been saying is not super controversial. Like I'm talking about the benefits of releasing often. Um, we can kind of all agree that that's probably a good thing to do. Uh, yet, I didn't see a lot of hands showing. I guess a few of you were uh, on every other week cadence, which is quite good. But I didn't see a lot of hands showing on the weekly releases. So why is that? So there's a lot of benefits. It can be done, but we're not doing it. Why? We're lazy. I, I don't think that's the, that's the answer. Usually if there's a good business reason, people will do it. So something's preventing us from actually doing this. So what I hope to do now is to look at a few of those reasons uh, that you might think are stopping you and convince you that actually they're not. That's a, it's a myth. So the first one, oops, sorry about that. The first one is this, Apple. Right, the App Store review process. If you've ever tried to publish an iOS app, you know that there is this review that you have to go through. And we don't really know exactly what goes on in this review, but basically you upload your app to Apple and they do something and they either accept or reject your app, right? Uh, and so you could say, well, how am I ever going to do multiple releases per week if there is this thing in the middle that I don't have any control of that's stopping me, right? Well. Take a look at this graph. So on the x-axis, you have time. So on the bottom left, you have uh, July 2015. And on the bottom right, you have uh, July last year, 2016. And then on the y-axis, you have the average review cycle time. So how long it takes to get an Apple review done on average. And it's true, actually. Back in 2015, it could take one to two weeks to get an app out. Uh, but you can also see a clear trend in the graph, right? It's definitely going down. And if you look um, to the very bottom, in the, t in the bottom right, um, the red line is actually approximately one day. So what that means is you can actually do, you can develop you know, Monday to Friday and then submit it on Friday, and it's likely to be out on Saturday. You can do that every single week. And in fact, um, I don't have any more data kind of going beyond 2016. But I've seen people talk about the two cycle, the two hour uh, review cycle. So this means submitting an app and then two hours later it's out. So in theory, you could be pushing multiple times per day. Except for that. Does anyone know what that is? <laughs> it's right after Christmas. So apparently uh, the, the people working in the um, review department of Apple, they also have to take vacation from time to time. I guess that's, that's only fair, right? <laughs> so in general, you can do it, but just beware if you're trying to do this continuous delivery, uh, just about after Christmas, don't expect to get your updates out. <laughs> fair enough. Okay. Then the other thing is, if you're going to ship a quality update every single day or every single week, uh, you can't sp spend a full day you know, actually doing the publishing, right? So you need to make it efficient. You need to automate it. So you're going to need CI. And um, the problem is that if you're in a company that always, already has a CI infrastructure, it's probably not going to be running on Mac machines, right? So what, up, what often ends up happening in the engineering teams is that each engineering team sets up their own CI system. It's the kind of thing that Keith and Thomas was talking about in the keynote have to go out, configure, buy a Mac, and set it up themselves. And you might say, well, how much, how hard can that be? 
So I actually went online and I uh, searched for an article on how to set it up. So this is part one of the article, how to set up a continuous build with Xamarin mm -hmm. with Jenkins. And this is what the article, part one of the article looks like. First you have some prerequisites, then you watch this video, then you install Jenkins app and Xcode, then you put in your signing assets, you put in the Xamarin SDK, the Android SDK, uh, did I mention Xcode? Uh, your provisioning profiles, uh, you set up uh, the plugins for Jenkins, you configure your build pipeline, and <laughs> it's just, it just goes on and on, right? And that's just part one. Uh, so it is not only setting it up and getting it right, but maintaining it over time is taking time away from you building features and providing value from your customers, which is what we want to be doing. Okay, so I hope to show you, and I guess you already saw it in the keynote, but I'll show you again, that um, you can get this in the cloud, basically. What about quality? Uh, you know, with mobile, it's really hard because you have all these various devices. There are literally thousands of different models out there, right? And each one is different. It has different hardware capabilities, screen sizes. It's running different platforms, different OS versions. And if you want to be confident that your app actually works, you want to test on some representative subset of those devices. Uh, and that's going to take you a long time. So what some companies end up doing is this. So they, they write up uh, Word documents with all the test cases they want, and then they uh, outsource the testing to you know, a specialist that has you know, all the devices, and they walk through the, the Word documents and taps the right buttons, write down the results in a Word document, and send it back to you for processing. But that doesn't really plug in very well into a CI system, right? And it takes a long time. I've spoken with customers who do this, and they could take one or two weeks to do a full pass uh, of, the, of the test. That doesn't work if you want to publish daily, right? It's way too slow. <coughs> so I hope to also show you uh, some other ways you can do this uh, with Mobile Center. All right, great. And so we talked about releasing more often. We talked about why that's a good idea, and you may have some objections, but I try to kind of refute some of them. Now let's get a bit more concrete and talk about what is it that you actually need to go and do to do this. So what are all the steps that you need to do to ship an iOS app? So obviously you're gonna have to have some way of figuring out, finding an idea and getting it implemented. And that's gonna be different in different organizations. How do you get it approved and so on. But if you look at the technical bits of this, uh, they are almost always the same across uh, organizations. So you have some CI system listening to source control change and then checking out that and uh, building your app for simulators and devices. And then you run maybe some unit tests or integration tests. It's fairly standard stuff. But that's not it, right? There's more stuff. What else do you need to do to publish to the App Store? Well, if you want a quality release, you're probably going to do some more testing. So you may have some UI or end-to-end -end test of the application that actually goes and installs it on a device and exercises the various screens. Uh, you can run that on real devices or simulators. But even so, you may not be fully ready to, or fully believe that you have a quality release that you're ready to ship. Uh, so what you want to do is easily distribute your app to some kind of manual testing process. And you want to make that as smooth as possible. Again, if you remember the keynote, uh, having to call a user and say, plug in your device, I'm going to email you this app. It's not exactly a smooth process. But what else? Like, we're clearly not there yet. Anyone? To publish to the App Store? Yeah. So you need to sign your app with your distribution profile, right? It's a different type of signature and different certificate you need for that. You may need to generate updated screenshots for your iTunes description, because maybe your UI changed. You maybe need some release notes. You may want to change your metadata. Then you have to go and actually upload it to iTunes Connect. You have to submit it for the Apple black box review. And then hopefully two hours later, it's approved. Uh, but then you have to go and publish it. But even so, you still don't have your update all the way out to the user, right? 
Because with mobile, they need to go and update. It's not like with web, where you can push an update out, and then the next time the user uses the app, they automatically get the latest. They have to pull it down. So if you look at all this together, it's quite a lot of stuff that you would need to do every day. So it can be maybe a bit daunting if you just look at this stuff. If you're starting from nothing today, you really have nothing, and you were to set all this up, it's just a lot of work. So what I hope I can show you is that with Visual Studio Mobile Center, um, you can set up the most kind of complicated bits of this, which is reacting to the source control change, uh, building your application, testing it, uh, and distributing it to beta users. You saw some of it in the keynote. I'm going to dig a bit more into some of the testing pieces. And when I say testing, I mean actually testing the application that your users would be using on a real device. Um, so this is a picture from Test Cloud, which is the system I'm working on. So we have real physical devices uh, that you in a cloud configuration that you can use for testing purposes. Um, thousands of them in, in multiple labs. All right. So with that, let me uh, show you some demo. So back to this application here. So this app actually has a bunch of UI tests. Um, and again, you can go to GitHub and you can download uh, them if you want to see them. Again, I'm not going to go uh, show you exactly how to write these tests. There are actually two talks, uh, one today and one tomorrow, about using Xamarin UI tests with something called SpecFlow. Um, so you can go to attend those. But I want to show you what the experience is like if you imagine being a developer, making a change to your app, and then wanting to test them automatically. So let's get this out the way here. And the nice thing about uh, Xamarin UI test is that it's a cross-platform testing framework. And that means you can run your test both on Android and on iOS. And much in the same way as Xamarin, if you architect your tests in a nice way, you can actually share a large part of the code base across iOS and Android. Um, so I'll show you what that experience is like. So we have a bunch of tests here. Um, so if you remember in the application, there was this past trips page. So this will test that if you go into one of the past trips, that you can hit some of these slider endpoints. This will move the slider. And this test will exercise pull to refresh functionality inside the app. So let's try and run this. So what I like to do here is that I like to run it on iOS and Android at the same time. So now the iOS test is kicking off. And I like to race iOS against Android to see which one is faster. So the IDE can't run two at the same time. So I'm running one inside the IDE in Visual Studio and the other in the console. Which one do you think is going to win? Be faster? <coughs> the real device? Well, the iOS got a head start, though. So you can see it's now, the Android app is now going in. It's going into the past trips. It's going into James's trip, if I remember correctly. Yep. And <coughs> yeah, now it's going on. Oh, did the iOS one got stuck? Let me try and relaunch that. It's always a demo thing, right? Oh, I only ran one test. I wanted to run all of them. Well, then it's an unfair test. We don't know which one was faster. It usually it's actually Android. The emulator is quite fast. So you can imagine now being a developer and making a change and having this regression test. And then before you commit your change, you run all these tests to make sure you haven't broken anything. And the nice thing is you can go and you can drink your coffee while this is running. You don't have to actually manually do it. So that's really nice. One thing you might uh, ask yourself is, well, what if I don't know how to write any of these tests? Well, if you uh, 
want to get started really quick, you can use something called the Xamarin Test Recorder. I don't know if you've seen this tool before, but it's basically a way of uh, really quickly learning how to use the testing framework. So here's the Test Recorder tool, and I'll pick my Android SDK uh, emulator and then the My Driving application. And it's going to uh, connect to this application in recording mode. Takes a while to initialize. And then it's just going to launch the app. Now from here, I can hit this record button. And I can just start using the app and kind of do the test that I want to test. So I can skip the authentication here. I can navigate this hamburger menu thing. And let's say we wanted to go into settings. And I really want to use the metric system rather than Imperial. And now I want to go back into the screen and check that it actually updated. So let's go to the profile. And you see here now it's kilometers instead of miles. So now I can go over here and trigger this crosshairs here, which is like an assertion mode. So I want to assert that this element is on the screen. And you can see, so let's just stop this here. You can see every time I did something, it was generating and detecting a gesture, like tap uh, this button, tap this image button, tap settings, uh, wait for this uh, 159 kilometers. And over here, you can see the cor corresponding uh, Samarin UI to C Sharp code. Uh, it doesn't necessarily generate the best quality code, but it gives you a way to really quickly get started. And then you can refactor that into a better kind of test architecture. One thing you may have noticed here is that this last element here is saying app wait for element text distance. So it's just waiting for the ID of this thing, but not the actual text. But you can customize a bit here. So you can switch this over and say, I want to test that ID, but I also want to check that the text is 159. So you can tweak it a bit also within the test recorder. And then you can try kind of try it out, uh, run it from in here. Then it's going to replay it and um, and see if, if the test actually works. It's going to skip auth, hit the hamburger thing, uh, settings, checkbox, go back to profile, and assert that the kilometer is there. So at least now you're kind of getting started. That's what I said. I'm not going to do any programming today. I just run this, run this tool. All right, great. So let's shut this down. So that's one thing, having an automated test suite. Now the next thing is uh, running this stuff within Visual Studio Mobile Center. So you saw it in the keynote. Uh, I've set this up um, with the My Driving application. You saw in the keynote how to set that up. It's really easy. It takes five minutes. Uh, but what I want to show you is how do you uh, run a set of tests. So I'm now inside an application. And Thomas was mentioning that if you uh, want to use analytics and crash, you have to add this SDK. But you may also remember that uh, Keith and Thomas were saying that you don't have to use all of the things. If you only want to use tests, you can do that. So you don't actually have to add the SDK to run the tests. So I'm just going to skip that and go into the test uh, service here. And you see I've been running some tests uh, previously. I'll go into them in a moment, but now I want to show you how to actually kick off a new test. So you go into new test run, and then the first screen is figure out which devices do you actually want to test on. Uh, so uh, there is a set of devices I've been using in the past. I'm not going to go into that. I want to create a new selection of devices. So here you can see uh, we have whoops. Uh, 242 different types of device configuration. And a device configuration is a device model, like the Google Pixel, uh, combined with an OS version, like Android 8. So we also have the Google Pixel with Android 7.1.2, for instance. Um, so as you can see, it's, there's quite a selection of devices you can pick from here. So you don't necessarily need to keep all of these around on the office when you're developing. You can use the cloud for this. I'm going to filter this down. I just want to test phones. And my app only supports Android 8, 7, and 6. So I'll filter down to that. And then I'll just pick uh, one Android 8 device, uh, one seven, two sevens, one seven zero, 
uh, and six X devices. So now I've picked seven devices that I want to run the test on. Then I'll configure the test. And uh, to do that, you have uh, something called test series, which is just a way of grouping your tests. So you may have one set of tests that you want to run, say, on every commit, and another larger set of test suites that's more thorough that you maybe run every day or once per week. So I'll just use the master series here, which is just the default. Then you can pick which language you want the devices to be configured into. So if you were testing, um, uh, say, a Dutch application, you can make sure that the device is configured to use Dutch language. And then we support a number of different test frameworks. So I was using Samarin UI test here. If you're using Google's Espresso, you can also do that. Uh, Calabash and uh, a system called Appium. For iOS, we also support uh, XCUI tests. Okay, then the final screen here, uh, a bit more stuff. So to actually run these tests, you need to use the Mobile Center CLI tool. So if you haven't installed it already, you need to install Node and then just run this command. I already have that, so I'm not going to do that. I don't need to do this. But then all you need to do is run this one line to kick off the tests. So I'm just copy that out and jump to my screen here. And then I'm going to try maybe make this a bit easier here. So mobile center test run a UI test. The app here is the app name within Mobile Center. So it's the same as in the URL, uh, URL here. It's just the app name. Then um, there is this number here, which is a device selection. Um, I didn't give it a name, but I'm going to try to do that now and just call this my uh, smoke tests. So that if I want to use these exact same devices later, I can do that. And you see that now the, um, the device here changed. Instead of this number here, I can just put in this name, this group of devices. Then I need my, uh, my Android application, my .apk file. I specify my test series, my language, and then I need to specify the path to the compiled UI tests. So that's my driving. Uh, my driving UI tests in XTC here, and then I just run that. So what that's going to do is it's going to take my application, take my compiled tests, upload it to Mobile Sender, and then run it in parallel across these real devices, and then you get back a test result from that. So you, you can easily integrate, if you're not using the build system in Mobile Sender, you could integrate it into Jenkins, or uh, TFS or whatever you want. It's just this one line to kick off a test. OK, so I'm not going to wait for this. It will take a bit of time to upload and run the actual tests. But I have a test here from previously. So I want to show you what that test report looks like when the test is done. So you click into that, and you saw you have all of your tests passing. And it was running on eight different Android devices. And you can recognize these test names, for instance, the move uh, trip slider test we were running just before. So we can click into one of these. And what you see here now is uh, that test having run on the Google Pixel Android O, Android 7.1, uh, Samsung Galaxy running 7.0, um, and a Huawei Nexus uh, 6P running Android 6X. But that's all run in parallel, so that's really fast. And over here, you see the test name. And these bullets here are called steps. And basically, if you write in your test, you write app but screenshot and then a string, then that becomes a bullet over here in the test report. And it's generating a screenshot at that exact time. So you could do tap this button, tap this button, then do a screenshot. So you can see if we go up here and we, for instance, navigate to uh, this step here, then you see what the application was looking like at this time. And we can navigate down the step here. Now, uh, you can also jump in and get a bit more detail. So for instance, on this Samsung S8 running Android 7, uh, you can see kind of how much memory your application was using and kind of get some samples of CPU usage. And you can get more details about the device if you want to know more about it. But you can also dig in and get more details from the logs. So uh, this is the device ADB log. You can also get your test logs from the Samarin UI test, 
And if, in case there is a failure, you're going to get a stack trace from that, so you know how to debug it real quick. That's quite nice. We also have a preview feature here, which um, is basically like a video, um, like a low resolution video recording of this. So you can capture some things that are maybe hard to see with screenshots. All right, cool. So right now we've seen you can write tests, you can run them locally while you're developing, you can run this command line tool to run them in the test cloud on your selection of devices. Uh, but I haven't really shown you the full uh, CI pipeline yet, the build, test, distribute, right? Yeah, go ahead. You know the command that you run before, um, you, we are referring the, 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 the test, but is it local? The test is being uploaded to test cloud and it's being executed on a hosted service. No, uh, my driving the UI test bin. Oh yeah, it's uh, that I compiled the test on my machine and then I I upload it from my machine onto the test cloud in Mobile Center. Oh, okay. okay, so you could do that from your own CI system, but I think this is where you're getting at. Um, I've also done this with the iOS app. So I've pre-configured this, um, and I've set up uh, a build, okay? So you remember this one here? Like at the beginning of this talk, I made a change where I changed the color to black, and I pushed that. Well, actually, while I was talking, that was being built on a cloud-hosted Mac that we host and operate in Mobile Center. Uh, and in fact, the build was successful. So um, you can see here that I've set it to build the my driving iOS solution, built in debug mode, uh, building for device. And then I've set up this thing called a post build script. And what that does, you can click into the docs here. It's pretty basic. If you, um, if you create a shell script, like a bash, or if it's Windows, it's a PowerShell, then after the application is built, you can run any code. So in that case, I took uh, basically the command you saw here, and I put that into my post build script. There's a, there's a small tweak you need to make, but uh, it's basically the same command. And then that's being run as part of the build. Aha. Oops, so here. Yes. I'm not sure I understood the question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, you can build. Uh, you can run an iPhone app on an iPad. You can run a universal app, which has uh, the full kind of view of the iPad, and but it can also run on phone. Or you can just have iPad apps. You can do anything really. The test cloud both, it has both iOS devices and iPads. And let me show you that now. So um, if we click into this successful build here, it's going to download the, the logs from the build. And there's obviously a lot of stuff happening here. There's a neat trick here. If you search for section, you can see the various kind of things happening, setting mono version, installing provisioning profiles, restoring NuGet or NuGet. Uh, and uh, building the iOS, Samarin iOS solution, uh, copying the build to a staging folder, and here is my post build script. So it's running Mobile Center post build, and that actually ends up submitting tests to Test Cloud. So I have my iPhone 6 running iOS 10.3.3, an iPhone 7 running iOS 11, which was just released, and an iPhone SE running 10.2.1. So that's going to be tested as part of the build. And you can see that it passed. So this means that we can, uh, whoops, we can go into the test service here. And you can see that uh, I actually did run eight tests while we were talking and having fun here. Um, and let's take the same test again, the move slider one. Now, obviously, I changed the color of the title bar. So you should be able to see that in the test, right? So it takes a bit of time to load. And here you see current trip is black. 
So within 30 minutes, we were testing on multiple real physical devices while I was doing something else. Uh, and um, um, we got a pass, and that means that because the test passed, we go on to the next step in the phase, which is to strip it to manual testers, right? So this means I can now take my, my iPhone here, and, uh, oops, I'll show you here. So first of all, I got an email that, because I'm a developer, um, well, a kind of developer, uh, that uh, the test has passed, and I can click into the test report, but I'm also set up as a tester, and this means that I'm now getting the same email that Thomas was getting in the keynote, that there's a new build available, and now, I know that that build has already been regression tested because it passed all these tests. So as a manual test, I'm not wasting my time uh, you know, finding bugs that could have been found with automation. So we'll go through the full cycle here. So I'm logging in with my tester identity here. And you see here's my app. We'll click install here, and then you will see. So now you should be seeing that this has a black uh, top bar rather than the blue one once it needs to override and install this. Just a few seconds. It's pretty fast. Here we go. And then as a beta tester or a manual tester, I can go in and verify that I like this black change, which is pretty neat. All right, so I think that's it for my demo here. So let me jump back real quick to wrap it up with my slide deck. So I hope to have shown you that some of these objections you might have towards doing this delivery are actually not really true. So the app review cycle now we're talking about the two-hour app review. So myth busted. You don't need to go and read this article about how to set up Jenkins and spend engineering time doing that. <laughs> myth busted. And you don't need to do this writing of Word documents and sending it and outsourcing it to manual testing and getting it, having to parse those results in the form of Word documents. That's busted. Now, uh, maybe other things that are preventing you, but at least some of the things that you maybe think you can't do, you can actually do. So again, uh, my message is release more often. Try to kind of increase your cadence. And if you want to try out Mobile Center, you can go to this URL. It's free to try out here in the beta, and a lot of the services will continue to be free when we go uh, GA. All right, that's all I had. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's one. Do you want a microphone or something? No, I do. Okay, yeah. Uh, can you put the bar resolution when you pick devices on the test file? Uh, I think so. I can actually not remember. It's in the test file, the old one, you cannot feel the bar resolution is quite annoying. Oh, interesting. Uh, let's go back here to my organization. Test. You're right. That's actually a good. Uh, that's a good idea. It yeah. might be, uh, especially for Android, it might be a good thing to do. Yeah. yeah thanks for the feedback. Uh, there's another question: Is when you generate a new code, can you see the devices that are attributed to that code? Because imagine I, I generated three codes, and in the end, I don't know which devices are in that actual code that you're generating. I'm not sure what you mean by code. So when you when you basically pick the devices, right? You yeah. Generate a little code that oh yes. So can you see? all the devices that are inside of that code. Yes, so we added a feature in, uh, in Mobile Center Test Cloud called Named Device Sets. So what you can do here is basically you just give it a name. Oh, okay. Instead of having the code, you have this name, and then you can click on this info and you get a list, and you can edit it and you can do these things. It yeah, it, it's annoying. Yeah. That's why we did it. <laughs> yeah, because in Xamarin Test Cloud, you didn't have this feature. Yeah, okay. So this is like the next generation of Xamarin Test Cloud. Okay, other questions? Yeah? When we write the test scripts, and we change the position of the elements, I think the scripts later, 
I, I can't really hear you, sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not fully sure. I'm going to repeat the question how I heard it. So, you, are you asking that uh, depending on the OS version of the device, you may have different controls uh, in the UI? Is that where? No. Layout. Depending on layout? Controls are laid out in the form. Yeah. Right? You click in uh, various points. Yeah. So later, next version, I decide to change the layout. Oh. <coughs> yes. So, so what you're saying is if I change the UI, is the test going to break? But actually not, right? Because if you look, um, let's jump into any one of these tests. Uh, so. For instance here, I'm going to scroll down to a particular class. So if you move that class around, it doesn't matter, right? Or you may be looking for something with a particular ID. So if you move that around, the test still works. Yep. Yep. I mean, you can also, if you want to, you can use coordinates, but it's more fragile. There's a question in the back. Yeah, yeah, there are definitely problems. Uh, yeah, well, I guess this doesn't support it. But yeah, like finding a specific coordinate within a map, yes, then you probably need to use x, y coordinates. But for the most part, you can run it with IDs and things. Yes? Is there a certain uh, level where the, that you find that um, sometimes if the test case is so complex that it just doesn't become valuable writing yes. test cases? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a balance. Um, it takes time writing tests, and you want to make sure that you're not spending all your time writing the test and maintaining the test suite. And honestly, I think it's better to, if you end up in a situation where you have really complex tests and they're flaky and they're hard to maintain, just delete them and, and, and have a faster build, have the faster tests, and then do um, <coughs> maybe more uh, manual testing for those things. Also, there are some things you just can't automate. It's okay to have a, a manual test pass for that. Just make sure that everything you can automate, you do automate. Because you don't want humans you know, following a script and doing a machine's job. It's a waste of people's time and it's not fast and it's flaky, right? Do you recommend more, um, like you were saying, I've done some tests before where I've used like, just automation IDs but also tap coordinates. And I found that when you use more tap coordinates, it becomes, as you're saying, a bit more yeah. flaky. Yeah. Do you recommend like, just trying to stick to you? Yeah, in general, yes. In general, yes. Uh, there may be specific cases where it's the right thing to do. You're going to have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. If you feel like it's providing a lot of value and finding bugs and uh, giving you more confidence, then maybe it's worth that overhead to main keep maintaining the tests. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, in the keynote, there was a, uh, they mentioned about a code push. A code push, yeah, for uh, React. Is it only for React? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. But even if it's for React, um, is, isn't it against the Apple guidelines that we can't inject the code? It is slightly beyond my area of expertise. I think it's like borderline. So the question is whether code push is against the Apple. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really say. Um, I think it depends on how much you change, right? Um, you can compare it to things like having feature toggles in an app. In theory, if you have a feature toggle in an iOS app, you actually have different behavior depending on whether the feature toggle is on. Not just the feature, I mean, if I recall correctly, they had some guidelines for the store, Apple uh, store, that like you could not have dynamic injection. Yes, store. yes, that's true. I, I don't know the details. You need to ask maybe Keith or Thomas. Um, but what I'm saying is, if you just use it to do very simple things, then it's kind of like a feature toggle in a sense. It's just more dynamic. I don't know. Don't take my answer as a legal. Uh, I, I don't give legal advice. Um, I don't know. I think it's border, borderline. OK, other questions? No? 
well, if you want to talk to me, I'm going to be here. Uh, so please feel free to do. And otherwise, have a great conference. Thanks for listening.